All right, let me go ahead and share my screen while I have a minute. All right, am I missing anybody? Hey, hey Mark. Hey there. Uh, let's see. Chris Borcher, is he there? Yep, I'm here. All right, thank you. And William? William always seems to take a little bit of time to get the microphone going. It's kind of weird. Hey, Colin, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Thank you. Jim Curtis. Yep. Hi. Hello. Uh, da -da -da. J. L. Butler. Yeah, hey, is that Doug? Yes. Yeah, hey, it's Jesse Butler. How are you? Hey, good. Okay. This is your first time here, isn't it? Yeah, I just uh, I just move over to uh, a new DevRel role uh, in the cloud. So I'm going to be focusing on um, serverless, and a couple of projects. So I figured I'd start cool. listening and see if I can help. Excellent. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Good to hear from you. Uh, you're hey, there. William here. Oh, hey, William, finally. <laughs> um, all right. I said somebody's name in there. Who was that? Uh, you're in here. You're and Thomas, here is Rachel with you. Uh, no, I work on one Wednesdays or Thursdays. Okay. Uh, Hi, this is uh, Ori. Oh, hello. Hey, sorry I'm late. No problem. You're not late. Anybody else that I'm missing on the agenda for the list of attendees? Yes, uh, Klaus is here. Oh, hey, Klaus. Hi. Yeah, hi, this is Arun. Hello, Arun. Steve here. Steve O, thank you. Doo -doo. Usually goes about three after for the new folks. Let's see. Ginger, are you there? Yeah, I am. Okay, right, cool, gotcha. Thank you. Uh -huh. Neil Avery. Hi there, how are you doing? Hello. Are you new to the call? I can't remember for sure. I, I apologize. Am. No, I am. Yeah, I, uh, I've been watching the videos of the previous meetings. So um, I'm from Confluent. Confluent. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, Anybody else on the call that's missing from the list of attendees? Hi, Doc. Kathy oh. here. Hey, Kathy. Hi. Hey, Doug. It's Lil here from IBM. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Actually, for those of you who don't see it, paste it one more time. There's the list. There's the attendee. I'm sorry, the, uh, the agenda. The, the star indicates a confirmed attendee of the yeah, The star just indicates that I've heard you. That way people don't try to game the system by adding their name without actually showing up. Yeah. So you added my name but didn't add a star. Oh, I'm sorry. Who was that? Arun. Arun. Oh, John, I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you for keeping me honest. All right. Tell you what, it's three after. Why don't you go ahead and get started? Got quite a few things on the agenda today. I want to try to finish it all up. Um, so let's see. First of all, uh, let you guys know that the CNCF created a new mailing list. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they not only moved us from Google Group to this list.cncf.io for the serverless working group, uh, just today they created a cloud events working group. And while it's annoying that we're going to have multiple mailing lists now, um, it probably is the right thing to do because cloud events is its own little thing now. It's not 
just under the serverless working group. So as you can see, here's the uh, URL and the email, I'm sorry, yeah, the email address for the group itself. Everybody in the serverless working group who's on the other mailing list, on the serverless mailing list, should have been copied over. If you didn't, just follow the link there to add yourself. Um, I'm not sure whether people got the same pains that they went through on the serverless working mailing list or not, but give it a try and uh, we'll work through it. Anyway, so try to send cloud event uh, topics to that mailing list as opposed to the serverless one. We'll keep the serverless one for the serverless working group. All right, so let's see, uh, serverless face-to-face. -face. We do have the doc here. If you are planning on going, <clears throat> please add your name to the list so that we can get an accurate account for uh, the headcount. And in, just as important, please try to add suggested topics so people can pre um, prepare for them in advance. In particular, what I would really like to have is people sign up for these topics down here at the bottom. This is just my initial guess. It's some of the bigger ones or meatier ones that I'd like to use the face-to-face -face time to get through. I tried to put some names next to some of them. I thought based upon you know, what, they, what people have spoken about in the past, they might have an interest in those topics. Please add your name next to one, or if I mislabeled you, you know, remove your name, or if you're okay with it, remove the question mark, you know, whatever. But please, if you take ownership of it, please try to send out in advance just your initial thoughts or proposal or something so people can think about it before we get to the meeting. Other than that, you know, or if not, that's fine. Uh, just hoping maybe you could lead the discussion at the face-to-face -face itself, just to keep us going forward. Okay. Hey, Doug, it's awesome. Yeah, what, yeah what I was going to ask you. Do you, have a, do you have an address yet, Austin? Um, I have a conflict, unfortunately. Oh. The exact opposite of what we're looking for. Um, so we've got a challenge here. And uh, as of right now, we can't, we can't host the face-to-face. -face. It's breaking my heart. Um, but if there's anybody else with a fantastic office near Moscone Center. Yeah, we are a few blocks away. We can do that if you want. Okay, so Rachel, you're offering to host? Yeah. Okay, so hold on. So Google's going to host. Can you paste into there the location? I can. can Let me, I'll confirm where the best space is before I post something. Okay. So hopefully that doesn't mess anybody up, but I, I can't imagine it's more than a block, more than a couple blocks away. So it shouldn't be that big a deal. All right. Anything else related to the face to face then? I, I guess one question I have for people. Um, a few weeks ago, someone asked, uh, how many people do we have to get to have quorum? And we didn't really decide on a particular number, but we have at least 11 right now. That seems like it is sufficient. Is there anybody who questions that that's enough to make it an official meeting? Assuming we do have the Zoom set up. Okay, not hearing any objection then. This will be an official meeting then. All right, any other topics, questions about the face-to-face? It is next Friday, not tomorrow, the day after, the week from tomorrow. All day, hopefully nine to five, San, Google office, San Francisco. All right, not hearing any, thank you guys. Well, yeah, I mean, I you do have the, an, a slight concern that this was raised last meeting that other people have other commitments around DockerCon. And so having the entire day blocked out might not, might not be doable for everyone. Yeah, understood. Um, yeah, so we should, if, if we need to have consensus on something, we should c certainly not do that while people are away. Yeah, it's just I'm not sure how many people we lose before we reach that bar. Um, Alex, Alex, I know you, I mean, you have some stuff going on there. Um, do, that you still have to, do you have to make decisions face to face? Can that not just be done in the normal way where we can all make the work group call following week? Right. So it, I think it depends on the topic. So what I was going to, what I was planning on doing was for a proposal that's been out there for more than a week, because that's the general rule that we have. Um, we can make a decision on that at this face to face because it's been out there. People have a chance to comment on the issue or PR and stuff like that for a proposal that's brought up at the face to face. We, we all, we can agree on a general direction at that time and say, yes, this is the direction we'd like to go and there's general consensus. I don't think it's fair to take an official vote because that's less than that one week period. So for new topics, we won't, we won't officially approve it then. But for existing ones that have been out there for about a week or so, I think that's fair game. Does that sound right to people? Yeah, I agree. Okay. So Alex, so for example, or Alex or anybody else who feels like they may not be able to make the entire meeting, if there are existing topics out there that are you know, popping up on the agenda, 
um, please review those PRs in advance. There aren't, luckily there aren't that many of them. I think we have a total of maybe only 18 PRs, so it's not exactly a huge list. So, okay. all right, anything else in the face-to-face? -face? All right, um, let's see, face-to-face, -face, next workshop. Yeah, okay, so. Hey, Doug, I couldn't get to the mute button quick enough. Is, is the intention for that to be from nine to five? I was hoping to, is that an issue? Uh, it will be for me. I, I'll, I, I won't be able to make the whole day, but, um, but I'll, I'll try to come. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'd like to make the most of out of our out of our face to face time if possible. Would it be so? Yeah. If we so we have topics. Would it be helpful if we broke that into an agenda so that people could decide, like if they have limited time, so they could decide what is most important? Yeah, it's, it could almost be better to have the yeah what's being proposed there a, a rough and agenda and time blocking for it. Um, you have the brainstorm for for a demo, the next interrupt demo. That would be useful to do with them, perhaps the most people there. So I could definitely try to put together an, an agenda. I'm not quite sure how that works out though with people like yourself, Alex, where I suspect your overlap with DockerCon is gonna be dictated by however they set up Friday's DockerCon schedule. So it's gonna be out of your control, I assume, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, would, would, it be else, would it be helpful then if the people who cannot be there all day, if on their name on the uh, list of attendees, if you put down which topics you're most interested in and which times work best for you, even though you may not be able to answer for yourself, Alex. Because um, then I could try to, you could try to schedule things for those times if possible. Mm. I, I just, I just don't know how to do it because a lot of these things are, are going to yeah. be kind of free flowing, right? I guess most of us should be around um, over, over lunch, depending on what's going on. Yeah, except we may be taking. Although we do, we do have some <laughs> sessions that run through lunch already, like the serverless panel and the container sig earlier in the week. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm not sure how to work that. I'm open to suggestions, though. So I, I think Doc, either you know, I think there your suggestion say you know, people who can only join part of the day can give their available time slots, and the interested topics. I think that's 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 a good suggestion. Or you can just give a time for each topic, like roughly, the time. Okay. Well, why don't we start with that? Why don't we have people put down the times that they will be able to make it, and what topics they're interested in, and we'll see if we can try to align those as best we can. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. All right, anything else We're up face to face? All right, cool. <clears throat> so Kathy, you had an action item to write up a more formal proposal for the work stream slash function composition stuff. I was just wondering, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm wondering, um, do you think you'll have that in time for the face to face? Yeah, uh, I would have it. Uh, I would post it. If you go to the you know that work stream proposed. Uh, oh, you already posted. I didn't realize that. I'm not sure whether this link. Let me take a look. No, not this one. It's the other one. Okay, could you go back? Which other one did you want me to go uh, to? Up, up the first, up. Oh. Yeah, here. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, so did people get a chance to review this yet? I'm assuming maybe not. So tell you what, why don't we do this? Why don't we um, take everybody take the action item to review this document and then Kathy can present it and we can talk to it at the face-to-face? -face? Okay, sure, yeah. It where, is where not is long, it's a short where, talk. The where link, is the link to this? It's in the AI section. Let me go ahead and copy it and put it down. Do, 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 where is it? So this is the workflow uh, proposal. This is Glenn, by the way. This is the workflow proposal that was brought up last week? Correct, yes. yes. Okay. It's, it, it's not long, it's a sh I purposely made it very short so you can go through it. Uh, well, you will not spend much time, you know, going through it. Looks great, Kathy. And Doug, I think this uh, function workflow is uh, a good topic to address at our face-to-face it could be kind of wide ranging. Yep. 
All right. Any other comments, questions about um, that proposal? Uh, otherwise, perhaps, I'll save it for the face to face. Perhaps others could bring uh, proposals as well and maybe present at the face to face. Yep. All right, so Austin, you added a, a, a topic to the agenda about the, uh, the SDK stuff. You wanna talk about that right now? Yes, it's just a quick question for everybody. Um, you know, we all voted on where we think uh, we should allocate our efforts. It seems like there was a lot of interest in the, um, in the workflow topic. Uh, one of the other items out there that we voted on was just building some simple SDKs and libraries around cloud events. Uh, even though we decided as a working group that we're not going to focus on that right now. Um, I believe some people are already trying to make some SDKs and libraries for cloud events. Our company certainly is. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of who's working on this right now and if there's a way that we can collaborate with each other. We, we, uh, we created one as well for Extend. I think I sent you that, Austin. Yep. Um, of course, it's early days. We don't have anybody using it yet, but we're, you know, we're interested in it and we, we definitely want to, you know, get on board. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, then I'll definitely reach out to you, Glenn. Is there anyone else who started kind of nibbling at this? Uh, Thomas from Google. Uh, I actually have uh, an early draft as well. Uh, I'm trying to ship it around internally and see like how we want to position it. Um, like ideally, I'd like to use this to start kind of papering over the gaps that Google has from cloud events. Fantastic. I think um, uh, John Mc... We're also interested in that. Okay, John, John McKay um, from Puppet, Puppet and OpenFaz had a, um, a Java, sorry, a, Go, a Golang um, struct that he was parsing into for cloud events. And I think Project Dispatch may have had something similar for their for their demo. Um, so we're probably are all creating these structs or at least these definitions. Um, it could be useful to have them in a common place or not to have to keep rewriting exactly the same code. Yeah, right. agreed on the, the marshalling. Agreed on the dispatch side that uh, we definitely have, you know, the same structs, etc along with uh, code that we were putting into event handlers uh, or event drivers. So I think we're all moving in the same direction, especially with respect to Go. Is, is, the, is the intent with the SDK is purely to sort of provide sort of the ability to handle the events or is it sort of starting to delve into kind of, kind of reconciling the different types of events you get from different providers for you know, similar services? Is that something that exists or? seen existing in the SDKs? I think first we have to figure out who, who's interested in working on this and then set the scope. And those are great suggestions as to what the SDK could do, John. Um, Would this be a good topic for the face-to-face -face meeting to try to get a little consensus and uh, commonality or sharing of stuff? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm gonna, you're not gonna be there. Well, Austin, are you gonna be there or, or is it just that you can't host? Oh, sorry. I'm definitely going to be there. Uh, we can't host, though. Okay. Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm going to figure out from our side what sort of code we um, are building for the Azure Functions Functions integration, mm -hmm. um, because we should be able to share that. And because it's not only Azure Functions integration with the grid that we have, but it's uh, it's broader than that. So um, I'll go and ask those folks, and then see what we can put into. I mean, ultimately, we're gonna we're gonna open source it all, but uh, the question is whether we can go and break those pieces out and then put them into a different repo. Yeah, I think that's a direction that would make sense to move in, so that we're not vendoring Microsoft slash Azure slash cloud events. Maybe yeah, exactly. Like we have this cloud events repo. Maybe there could be something um, or org, org. Maybe there could be something in that. Yeah, there's there's a, a bit of um, for, for the product code then. There's all kinds of weird things, but I'll 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 try to I'll try to get us get us a C sharp thing. Would, would okay. it make C sense? Sharp. Would it make sense to open up an issue around this, and then we can yeah. all paste links to the code that we have, and that would make it easy for people to be able to find it. Absolutely, I think I'd sort of volunteer. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> Thanks, Mark. There you go. Yeah, I would. So I, I would. I would like to have a, a for for um for the dot net for the dot net crowd. It'd be nice to have just have a NuGet that has the necessary structures um, to go and deal with the cloud event and with digitalization and all this thing, and that then gets used by um, the you know, all the other stuff that we do. So I'll I'll talk to the first. Right. Yeah, I mean for that to be to for that to be useful for .NET, it probably needs to be pu published as a NuGet package or something like that. That's right. But I'd be happy to work with you on it. Um, we have a template for .NET. C sharp could make use of it. So I see someone's posted in the chat about Java. Another post, another person posted in the chat about Go, and then some folks have been talking about C sharp. Would it make sense at a base level to use Swagger and then be able to generate uh, SDKs in all these languages? Uh, um, That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, so having some experience with uh, doing things with Swagger, kind of in that way. I'm not a big fan of that approach because they swag, the swagger generated stuff yeah. ends up being a little weird in every way. Yeah, I, 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 That's huh. true. I, it doesn't hurt to have it, but I think it's in terms of like specifically like making the API idiomatic is where it tends to run into holes. Um, yeah. Trying to tweak it to really feel like a natural experience. So I'm going to call time on this, yeah. not because it's not an interesting discussion, but I think this is better for the face-to-face -face and for the issue that Mark is going to open up. So let, yep. let's, let's table this right now, because yep. I do want to try to get, get some uh, PRs and stuff that are open. Can yeah, and, and first we should have the scope conversation too. So yes. kind of chiming in on that issue with what we think the SDK should do for you know, 1.0, um, I think would be helpful. But overall, you know, we put out a, a great specification. It could solve a whole bunch of problems, uh, create a big impact. And now I think it's going to be great to work together to put this in hands of, into the hands of developers via SDKs, libraries, um, anything that adds convenience around this. So yep. looking forward to chatting with all of you at the face-to-face -face about it. All right. And so with that, let's adjourn. Let's skip that one or move on to the next one. A couple of what I kind of consider to be more maintenance issues than anything else. Um, before we get to some meteor discussions. There are two issues that have been lingering, which I put comments in that I would like to close because based upon how I, what I've heard people say in the past and the sentiment of the group, I don't think there's a whole lot of interest in doing these. If however, someone on the call does feel differently, just speak up and I, we won't close it, but I'd like to see if we can close this issue right here at an authentication context attribute. Based upon what I hear so far, I, did, I haven't heard anybody saying that they actually want this. So I'd like to close this one if people are okay with that. <sighs> Not that we can't reopen it later. <laughs> but uh, there, right now. There's a problem that this seeks to solve that's important. I don't know if this is the best way to do it at this time. It seems maybe a bit early, in my opinion, uh, for this. Um, okay. And maybe we can get some, you know, get this in the hands of users and, you know, see how they're trying to solve it and find the solution organically from that. Right. Because yeah, yeah, the entire topic of security better. is something we haven't even talked about yet. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd, I'd rather have, have this handle with security and encryption and signing since it's kind of in the same way and it's, a, it's affecting quite a lot. Right. I thought we had um, already put security into the spec for the http that um clements is working on that's right and i'm pretty we sure have, we, so have we have this we already have, so we have we have um so specifically we have um this we have authorization there where i think it belongs and that is at the transport um at the transport level when it gets to the to the exact gesture of um, how you do the transfer so we have this in the webhook spec we don't have this. We don't have that in the specs that do that deal with projecting the the message onto um, uh, onto messages because for MQP um, and for MQTT the whole notion of how you do authenticate is not happening at the message level. That's actually happening at the at the connection level, and moving that into the message will actually not help you with anything because the brokers will not be able to deal with that authentication field. So there's a there is a question of whether, so ultimately 
to, to make use of something that is inside of the message, that would only, the only thing that would make, make sense there is, is a signature where you then can go and decide based on the value of the signature, whether you want to go and take that message because it's coming from a source that you trust plus a source that hasn't tampered, plus the message has not been tampered with. That's how you'd usually do that sort of thing. And we have a different thread, a different issue that we had about signatures and that's also complicated. But this one just as a, as something that writes inside of the message is something that is actually not doable in protocols or makes no sense in protocols such as MQP or MQTT. Um, and it does make sense at a request level for, MQ, for, for HTTP just because that's a choice of HTTP to do that on a request basis. All right, so is there anybody on the call who would like to keep this issue open? Okay, any objection then to closing the issue? Okay, what about this one? A receipt queue context attribute, basically specifying the destination. Anybody on the call who would like to see this one remain open? There's normally you would have a you publish to a topic, and then something will um, figure out what queue that might go on to. I, I guess. What is this trying to get to? It's trying to put some internal knowledge of what queue queue it should be processed on. Yeah, what we've we've specifically avoided doing things like specifying the URL, as a, the, the destination address, as an example. That's something outside the scope of us of our, our spec. I think this is the the um, there's a construct in MQ for um, for where you get receipts after. So this is not the even the reply queue. This is the receipt queue of where you want to have notifications for when that event was ultimately delivered. And it's really a more a messaging concept than it is an eventing concept. And I can see that being useful. I just don't see that being so useful that we should have that at the top level attribute. That looks like an extension to me. And, and maybe if we see widespread use, then that's something that um, may be worth promoting into the standard, but it's some, not something that I would that, like. So this would something like go use an extension and then come with that extension back when you've shown that it's useful. So I would close that for now. Okay. Any objection to closing this one? Anybody want to keep it open? I, I do think it's, uh, you know, it's valuable. It's, it's your own, but uh, again, I don't want to insist on having it. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, I, since some people, Clemens and your honor both expressed some interest in maybe this thing should live on, let's not close it then. Let's figure out whether we want to close it later or define it as optional or make it an extension. But I, I was assuming people didn't want it at all, which is no, not. It's, so there's, there's, some merit, there's some merit to it. And um, it is uh, the, one, the one messaging infrastructure that is actually doing things in this way is the one that comes from your house, Doug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. I, I, like I said, if we couldn't resolve it quickly, then I want to move on and we're going to keep that one, which is fine. Okay, so let's get to some of the other, what I consider to be easy PRs. First one, Colin, you are on the call, right, I believe? I am, thanks, Doug. Um, okay. So yeah, start. yeah, so this is uh, the NAS trans, NATS transport binding. Uh, very, very similar to the MQTT 311 binding. In fact, uh, I, I borrowed heavily from Clemens' uh, proposal. So thank you, Clemens. Um, it's really simple. NATS doesn't have headers, so it's structured mode. You basically take your event and uh, put it into the payload of NATS, which is a byte array. Right, now this one I believe has been out there for at least a couple of weeks now, and I don't believe there are any outstanding comments. Uh, there's so, one this morning that I need to rebase, but oh, yeah. yeah. yeah I, we can, we I, can put, work on that. I put that because I saw the merge conflict. Yeah, we can um, work on that offline. Okay. So as with all the other <clears throat> working draft documents we put in there, this is just to get some baseline out there so, so that people can open up follow on PRs. Uh, and so the general, the basic question here is are people okay with this general direction? And I'm not seeing any comments on there. I'm assuming people are. So let me ask, yeah, let me ask the formal question. Is there any objection to adopting this? I think there could be a few clarifications, like for example, how do you identify the its cloud events message within that? But I could uh, open it up in on this. Um, yep, that sounds great. Follow on PRs or good. Right. Any objection to approving? 
All right, cool. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank Clemens, you. You have a document for us to hopefully approve. Let me bring it up. Yes. Cool. Here you go. Uh, well, that's the that's the MQP spec. The MQP spec is also very similar to the MQP spec, and it's a it's uh, they are brothers and sisters now also with the NAT spec. And uh, just like the others, um, um, MQTT and the HTTP the HTTP uh, messaging spec. Um, what they do is they um, simply go and project the cloud events message in either this uh, structured mode or the binary mode um, onto the transport message and are furthermore not specific about um, um, you know, what that is being routed to and, and the direction of things being routed. Um, so this is for uh, effectively anything that's using MQP to be able to leverage um, um, the cloud events format in a predictable way. So this will be compatible. So, and, and the way this is, is crafted is that it's going to be compatible with um, effectively all the existing MQP uh, brokers um, and, and messaging infrastructures that are, that are out there. There's um, uh, on the ingester side, um, there's IBM message bus and there is um, the NMAS project uh, from Red Hat um, that's wrapping Kafka. There is uh, event hubs from our side. And then there's various messaging brokers from MQ to um, Apache Kafka, uh, uh, Apache um, uh, ActiveMQ and Cupid, etc. And our on our brokers, which all speak MQP, and uh, this will be enabling those. All right. I don't see any outstanding questions or comments on this one. So, is there any objection to adopting this one? Has it as the the other one? It's just a working draft. All right, not hearing any objection. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. All right, hopefully this uh, next one is easy. This is, I think, just more syntactical, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of spots where we use the word property instead of attribute. So just syntactical. Any questions or comments or concerns about this one? Any objection to approving it? Done, easy. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, this one, hopefully it's not that controversial. There are a couple of things here. Let me start at the bottom. So first, I thought it was really weird that the spec itself did not have an example. Uh, I know that people can obviously jump over to the JSON encoding spec if they want to see an example, but it just feels a little odd to me that our main spec itself has no examples whatsoever and it's just straight text. So all I did is steal the example from the JSON one um, just so people have something to look at without having to leave, leave the main spec. Obviously, as we update the JSON spec, we're gonna have to update this example. But I think this makes the spec a little bit more readable. So that's the first change. The second change in here is, I, the TOC was a little messed up. We didn't include everything at the, at the some things at certain levels are not included in TOC and other things were, so I just tried to make that consistent. So that's not a big deal. But I did remove the reference to the use case document and the reference document. I thought it was a little bit odd that the TOC pointed to them, but it's not actually in this doc itself. So it was weird that this doc's TOC points to a completely other set of documents without even explaining why it points to them. So what I did is I removed them from the spec itself, but because they're interesting docs, I put them in the readme. So from the readme, we point to existing use cases and the existing event structures that are out there today. So we don't lose the information. I just added, basically, in my opinion, a better pointer to them. So this is, for the most part, strictly syntactical changes. Any questions about that? Any concerns? Oops, that's good. OK. Any objection, then, to approving? I have a question. What's the difference between the use case and the use scenarios? <laughs> my concern is some people might put, you know, just randomly set one place to put. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a different issue. This doesn't try to address that. I actually am working on a pull request to try to resolve that particular issue right now, Kathy. Okay. This doesn't actually change those documents. It just changes where we point to them. But I, I will be trying to fix that confusion. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any objection then to adopting this one? All right. Thank you very much. I made it through quickly. All right, so Kathy, do you want to bring us up to speed on the correlation ID discussions that we had, I think it was yesterday? Yeah, 
So if you can open that, so people, I'm not sure whether anyone has a chance to go through this yet, but it's also short. And so this is what we, um, we discussed in yesterday's meeting. So the poor, the doodle poor result shows a, a meeting, majority meeting time, and then we chose that time and discuss this. Um, basically, we're going to have um, uh, add a new property. This is just either called property, uh, add a new attribute, like data attribute. It could be called property bucket, or could be called or could put, be put, or this could be put into the extension, um, uh, extension uh, section. Um, so uh, I I just you know put it into this property bucket section, but the name, you know, can be is open for discussion, and it will be a key value pair will be a flat structure. So basically I give an example there. And then there will be no duplication uh, in that party bucket. There should be no duplication of event, of uh, duplication of, you know, keys uh, in, the, in that party bucket. Is there a reason this wouldn't be just called properties? Pardon, could you, could you speak up a little bit? Is there a reason it wouldn't be just called properties? Um, it, it's open. Uh, no specific reason. I second that. Yeah, me too. It's like a very common pattern to just use properties. Okay. Bucket looks a little baroque. <laughs> so one of the things we talked about on yesterday's phone call is do we actually want a separate bag for these things or could we just reuse the extensions or have them all as top level attributes that yes. was also an option i yes. gave examples in a huge wall of text on, on the spr i think or on the issue one of those things because i so, dislike talking without having clear examples so just to set context this is really just a way to attach additional metadata to the event Yep. Yeah. Lives outside the payload, like for routing, business logic, that kind of thing. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Also, another clarification: we tried, especially in the binary mode, to keep things out of uh, JSON. So, uh, in a binary mode, would that still be sort of a JSON structure within an extension? Uh, that would be a yeah. So that would it's a, so this structure would have to flow in um, if it's if it's if it's a separate um, uh, if it's a complex type as it is here, um, then it would be a header that then would effectively have to carry um, you know, encoded data, encoded structured data. If we simply say we're allowing these properties to be top level, so making the top level extension mechanism then um, the encoding f for the binary mode is obviously easier. Yeah, so, I yeah. think we should just uh, prefix them for uh, binary mode, just have uh, yeah. so, like in HDPC dash something dash, because uh, you, know, you don't necessarily want to put uh, base64 or something like that within the, the previous. Yeah, that's th so the prefixing thing is that w w this, is, this is effectively where we end up with uh, Discussion where I'm, I'm still, I still haven't done the harmonization because all the, the, uh, the transport specs weren't done yet. Um, I'm, so in terms of prior art, there is um, just to cite two things quickly. So in in MQP and in MQTT, there's special buckets um, that are for user properties. So they could, and that's how I would map those. I would go and take those and map them. Um, into there's a user properties bucket and there's a, a properties bucket and I would probably go and, and put them there. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I would create some stop structure for those. I would because that makes a lot of things hard, especially if you have some infrastructure which does filtering. It's not clear that for filtering rules you always have access to stuff that is kind of more structured data inside of a of a top level transport property. So having that structure is going to be a little harder. Um, if we allow um, top level extensibility and simply say we're going to prefix these kinds of properties in a in a in a in a, uni in a uniform way, um, that would get us out of that um, problem. For um, for our HTTP mapping for our products, so for service bus and for event hubs, 
what we've chosen to do is for all of these kinds of properties, um, we're prefixing them simply with p dash, and and then we take the normal uh, the normal name, and um, then effectively in the programming model we uh, strip the p dash out again, but with p dash we make it easy for the trans for, for to avoid clashes with the transport properties. Um, right, and assuming a lot of user, usage is for things like routing decisions, etc. You don't yeah. want to make it too complicated and uh, resource. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the risk because because if we so if you think about what the transport mapping means, we already or, or already take today all the 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 cloud events properties and we're mapping them into that property bag, right? For MQP and for for MQTT. If we now took this took this property bucket. And made that it's, it made that an attribute. Then necessarily that attribute needs to have content that is a complex content. And in if you route this event via, let's say, um, you know, a message broker, the message broker can go and and look at the value of a property, but it cannot go and decode, you know, a complex type in that property. And the text processing capabilities of you know. A JMS message selector are obviously very limited, um, and so you can't really do a lot with that property bucket. So I'm, uh, we should allow custom properties, but I'm not sure that 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 model here is the right one. Now, since we're only talking about an abstract type system here, it could quite well be that we decide, hey, we're having a property bucket here in this spec, and then are are deciding in the transport specs to explode that in a different way and to say. No, we're actually going to make that flat. So that's a choice that we have, right? Sorry, so then I you have to define, the, for example, that it's a string type and, and things like that. You know, think yeah. about the naming convention. Sorry, I want to sneak in something here. There was a discussion yesterday regarding if we want another top-level field core properties or if this is going to be an extension. And it was uh, a difference between the two was uh, pointed out. Like we could have a another top level proper uh, a top level property called properties, which is just key value pairs uh, and both of them being strings, not full JSON objects, and the extensions actually being full JSON objects that may be parsed, uh, encoded, whatever, and that m might need a lot of processing. The idea was that if we do have a separate bucket, a separate top level proper. Uh, separate top level key for it, then it would just be a key value pair, which is easier to do quick processing of, especially in regards to routing and stuff like that. Yeah, I, th I think what I would, yes, that's great. But then you still have, if you still make this a flat property bag, you still have the problem that you need to go and project that property bag so into a message that um, you allow the, the infrastructure to go and process that message, right? And so, and, and the way how you can do this today with, with the current infrastructure that's, that's, that exists is in the user header section effectively of MQTT or of MQP or in the, in the uh, transport headers of HTTP. Um, and those are flat lists. And, and in those flat lists, our um, the, the other properties that we have defined in cloud events, there are already properties. So if you create a subsection underneath this, you're now making the processing of everything in that subsection really difficult. Well, it seems to me the easiest solution would be to not have a separate bucket, just yeah. make them all extensions and actually remove the wrapper around extensions. Uh, yeah, so yes. So th there's two, effectively there's two options. One is, we create we create a we create a properties bag here, because this is the abstract this is the abstract model, and then we can make a projection rule that says, for mapping this into a message, we can always say everything that comes from the properties bu bucket gets prefixed with p dash, and everything that comes from the extensions bucket gets prefixed with e dash, as it gets projected into MQP and into MQTT and in, in and into HTTP, so that the programming model. Right? A programming model can go and look at this abstract thing here and can go and say, we're going to, in the abstract programming model, we're going to go and create a property bag. Then we're going to hand that down to the transport layer, which is going to go and turn that into these prefixed expressions, which are exposed to you know, rule set, rules, et cetera. 
And then if you read a cloud event into your framework, then the framework can go and turn that back into that property bucket. That, that's, a, that's a thing we can do. And that's how you get the ugliness of the prefixes in there. So one of the other options too is this could theoretically be subsumed by the um, distributed tracing proposal because it does have the correlation context field, which already has, for example, an HTTP standard encoding. Um, the downside is that we would be limited in the number of bytes that we're supposed to use. The upside is that you can actually, like you will for free get integration into visualization and tracing frameworks. I know this was considered by somebody, Thomas, I think, and that was a issue or PR detailing why this won't really work. I am Thomas. Uh, so, <laughs> I what originally kind of came up with, so uh, I had looked at some parts of the spec. Uh, the correlation context is not widely uh, explained. Like it's it's not linked from the main side of the spec, and I I may have missed actually parts of the uh, details. So I actually last week appended my findings to saying, oh, there is actually correlation context. Um, because I was thinking originally of the um, trace context, which is totally different and not the right purpose. Um, so the, the big thing is uh, over an HTTP framework, I'm not sure if correlation context would be dropped or not. I know trace context may not be propagated. What, what are you referring to? I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, there is a WC3 spec called distributed tracing. Uh, it is the foundation for open tracing, which is like the pipeline that Prometheus and things fit into. Um, and it basically has two sets of related fields. One are just raw trace IDs. Uh, and there is a property bag that I originally thought was being proposed, which is for vendor specific metadata. And so that would be something that can get dropped into and out of a cloud. There's a second field called uh, correlation context, which is actually a property bag that has well-defined header encoding. Yeah, but we, I, think, I think what we want to have here is really, and this is, I think why this example by, by Kathy is great, is uh, what we want to have is application level uh, context setting. That's, and I think of that as being very different from um, what you use for tracing. Right, this is, this is for, this is for, this is effectively classifying, hey, there's a sensor that sits over in that corner, and I want, now want, want to go and route events from that sensor to a particular location. I think that's somewhat orthogonal to the concern of, you know, tracing, um, tracing events that are coming from, from various contexts. Yeah, I, I agree with um, Clemens. Um, and, and you need to have some, I think you need to have that, that the richness effectively of allowing arbitrary metadata definitions here. It's just a question of how we're gonna go and project that correctly. So. I, go ahead, Clemens. So I, I, think, I think if we go and project, if we just say we're gonna make a property bag, I think the, the after thinking about this for, for two more minutes, um, I think if we just go and, and project this out into the um, transport binding such that we are choosing a projection where we're making flat properties, but we're for each, each of these property bags, so this properties bag as well as the extensions bags gets a different prefix, um, we would be having a fairly clean projection into the various transports and the various metadata um, areas and then also be able to use, you know, leverage the transport level um, facilities um, while um, keep maintaining a clean separation. And we can go and in the abstractions that we build on top for programming, we can go and, and effectively plug out everything that's prefixed with P dash and, and staff that back into the properties collection. Um, and we can go and plug out everything that's, that's prefixed with E dash and and, and stuff that back into the extensions collection and then give people who are interfacing with the cloud events a clean view. While if you look at the events from the transfer perspective, you're gonna see those fields prefixed. But I think if you are, are dealing with stuff down at the, at the transport level, you understand what that means. So what's the advantage of having two separate buckets? Um, I, I still can't wrap my head around that. Oh. In both cases, they're both just extension pieces of metadata. 
Um, oh, I wasn't. I, I was. I was just. I was just going from the, the 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 fact that we have them. So I didn't try to have both discussions at once. Okay. okay. I, sorry. Go ahead. So if you, hey, if, you, if you if you now if you now ask me why do I need to have the extensions back, I can't give you a good answer on that. I was actually going to say I think we need some clarification on what exactly you would expect to see in properties versus extensions and vice versa, and yeah. I would suggest versus kind of following that up in a separate PR, right? Like a much, if this is really just an enrichment for what is effectively uh, descriptors of source, maybe this is just consumed into source. Like we started with source being an object and then we moved away from source being an object. And now we're reinstituting this object to describe the source better. Especially if this is gonna be mandatory, it might be worth kind of converging source yeah. into a richer structure. Okay. I would. I, I would. Mandatory, but it can be empty. Yes, yeah. it should be empty. That's right. And yeah. uh, this is not going to be just for the source. Like what was discussed is that the uh, middleware could also add some labels. Like a light bulb. Light bulb doesn't know its address, and that might be added by the apartment level even gate or whatever. Got a got a question here. After 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 this answer. Go ahead. Was there any consideration of like? some type of type descriptor like JSON LD or some way of being able to, you know, define being that this is open properties and we have lots of different mechanisms out there today for describing data. I don't care exactly which one is used, but was it considered to support, you know, some way of like attaching a schema almost to like, if I have a complex property that I'm passing in this bucket, I could, attach some type of attribute that would say here's you know jason ld was just one that popped off but i'm not set on that but it just seems like potentially that would be useful as a way to communicate that here's what this data is that would be a great other property right so so, so, so we, we, didn't, we didn't talk about that yesterday but what we did talk about was the fact that in order for someone to actually do something meaningful with in essence one of these extension properties they're probably gonna to have to know about it in advance and therefore they're probably gonna know about the specification that defines it. So you're so saying it doesn't need to be inlined in the data. They'll, they'll have built a system that has an expectation that the data that it's gonna be receiving for this specific type of event, but that requires out of band. I'm just wondering if there's a way to, I'm a big fan of you know, self description. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, 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 don't, I don't want to rattle. I just want to throw it yeah. out there. No, no, no. I, no, because it, 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 it is a good point, right? It, there's a. I guess it depends on what you plan on doing with the data, right? In order to actually do something meaningful with it from a semantic perspective, I don't think knowing the shape is going to help you at all. Well, right? JSON LD goes more than shape, though, right? That's why I threw out JSON LD because JSON LD is all about semantics as well. If you dig into it, because you have context, then you can describe. I mean, Google's using it for exact. I mean, it's really for describing data, not just validating the structure so so, th so then maybe we do actually have a reason for why schema url our field exists maybe <laughs> yeah, we also haven't that we also haven't really made sense of just yet that just somehow magically has shown up in the document from the beginning of time but um that we're all still confused about so that might be a place that, where that makes sense it's mainly up in the simple way that it exists, but I think if we if we want to go and, and carry some schema reference or references, um, that might be a good place to do that. Yeah, who was that? Uh, Clemens, I'd second back that point as well. Um, schema URL is definitely like I I imagine schema URL was going to be the place where um, if I needed to actually find the definitive source for you know vert type plus event type plus event type version. Right, like so Microsoft or Confluent or Oracle might have totally different schema registries. Um, it actually made sense for me for type and version to kind of be consumed into, you know, payload schema URL, right? Which is to say, here's where you can look up like a public facing URL for the definitive source on what this payload is. One question, this would be at the cloud event level, right? Like uh, the whole, uh structure would have to be described in this. Uh, I was thinking more specifically what's in data, right? Like we've left data to be this opaque section of the, not even opaque, like we're, we're talking about the envelope, right? We're not talking about the message. 
Um, if, but really, we need a way to say, here's what's in the message. That's what I imagine. If, if you're doing the crazy thing that. and are actually using protobuf in the, to encode your, um, your payload, then uh, without having a clear notion of what that schema is that belongs with that protobuf encoding, um, you're kind of lost. And so, you don't want to go into the message, into the data, which is the payload, to actually get these properties because we discussed that the payload might be encrypted and we want these properties not to be to be visible to the middleware and event routing and stuff like right. that. So they're yeah. promoted, they're promoted out. I think so so for this for these I think the discussion where, where, where Doug was trying to let the lead the discussion was kind of you know, do we need to have the extensions and the property and the properties, do we need to have both of them? Right. And and for that I actually don't see any reason, but I think we need to have that property back. So I, I just want to add, add one thing too. So the, the, the reason why I was also throwing out JSON LD and, and part of this too, is I, I need to understand more of what the semantics of what the property bag would be, but imagine it has mixed data, like different types of data. JSON LD does a really good job of being able to say, Oh, well, this property has this type associated with this property, as opposed to just a high level thing that says, okay, this is the type of the property bag itself, which is of course, another way that you can, um, address it see see Glenn just because that's you um, <laughs> it, it was it was it was very possible to go and associate individual schemas with every little island that existed in whistle yeah of course right. yes and I'm, I'm kind of trying to steer clear no no, no, no no I'm not trying to go down that I'm no. not trying to go down that route but you know, <laughs> No, Clemens, I, Clemens wants to reinvent soap in case you haven't figured that out. No, no I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm exactly trying the opposite. As I know, I know. Anything I don't know. I saw all those bindings, Clemens. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, quick question. anyway, quick question. It's, cool. it's, a good, is, it's a good conversation. I just wanted to throw it out there. So, so, let, so let, let, let John say something, then I think we have to cut it off right here. Yeah, so it's just, is the intent for this that, this, that these properties are specific to an individual source? Or are they intended to be something that could be common to multiple sources? Because if, if you're if you're consuming sort of the event and you know every property bucket contains completely different data, that's that seems to be a different thing. That does seem to lock it down very specifically to an individual resource. Okay, I'm gonna answer this. Sorry, because we're doing the same thing again. We're rehashing discussions that were already had on this topic, which is really annoying. Yeah, um, no. Because this annoys me, I wrote a huge wall of text describing what the use case actually is, what was discussed, and what points still need to be debated. If everybody could read that, and we would all have the same image, because this is getting quite complex with quite a lot of examples, and we're not all talking about the same examples, which is obviously means that we're rehashing the same issues, meeting after meeting after meeting. Right, so, 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 so with Vlad's comment, let me, I'm sorry, sorry, Kathy, I'm gonna have to cut people off here because we're running out of time. So Vlad, first thing, I know you pasted that into the Slack channel. Did you paste that, or can you please paste that into this particular PR so it's not lost? Um, it, second, the comment is on the PR. Okay, great, thank you. Second, people on the call, please look at this PR, comment on it. Let's get the discussion going back and forth within the PR itself. This is obviously going to be a topic for the face-to-face. -face. But we, we, since we are out of time, or almost out of time, there are two things I want to bring up. First of all, do we have a phone call next Thursday? I'm inclined to cancel it because people may be traveling either for DockerCon itself or at DockerCon or traveling for the face-to-face. -face. I'll be on an airplane to the face-to-face. Right. Is there any objection then to canceling next Thursday's meeting with the assumption that or obviously we'll, we'll have it on Friday for the face-to-face? -face? No, let's cancel it. No. Okay, yeah. no objection to canceling. Okay, and before I, before we complete the amount of time, people have vanished. Let me just finish up the roll call. <clears throat> Alex, hey, Bria, are you still there? Will there yeah. be a yep, I'm here. support for the face-to-face? -face? Say that again, Rob? Will there be support for people attending the face-to-face -face remotely? Yes, we're gonna try to have Zoom set up. Awesome. Yep. All right, and I think I heard Alex in there, right? Alex Debris? Yep, I'm here. Okay, Mark Fisher? Mark? Yes, I'm here. I'm struggling okay. with my mute button. Yes. Glenn, I heard Joe Sherman. Yes, I'm here. Uh, AJ? AJ Nair? What about Dan Barker? Here. AJ had okay. to jump off just about 10 minutes ago. Okay, that's true. He did comment. Okay, that's good enough. Savannah, are you there? Yes. Okay. Yep. Rob, I got Matt Rakowski. 
Hippie I'm Hacker? Here, but I'm on another call, sorry. Okay, that's fine, Matt. Hippie Hacker? What about Ganesh? Yep, I'm here. Okay, and I think I heard Stanley on the call. David Baldwin? Uh, here. And what about Hippie Hacker again? I, I can't remember your real name, I apologize. I want to say Chris, but I don't know if that's right. Okay. Anybody on the call who I missed from the agenda or for the uh, Rahul Gupta IBM. I'm sorry, who's that? Uh, Rahul. Can you add your name to the list, please? Yep. Uh, can I do it in the chat? Doug, yeah, that's, that, that's fine. Do it in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Anybody else? Oh, Rahul. Sorry. Okay. All right. With that, we are adjourned and we'll talk to everybody next Friday at the face to face, one way or another, hopefully. Thank you guys very much. And please comment on this issue in particular so we can try to resolve this at the face to face. Thanks, everyone. All right. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you later. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.